Section B, Part B of the trade-offs in biodiversity, oh, trade-offs of biodiversity and agriculture. It's very soon after lunch. Um, <laughs> we've got another really great set of talks today on this nexus of biodiversity and agricultural trade-offs, um, starting off with Brett Bryan from Deakin University in Australia. Thanks, Liz. Well, it seems loud, but... Okay, so I'm going to talk about... Uh, sustain Is that too loud? Sustainability in, in northern Australia. So many of you won't know much about uh, the, the north. Uh, it's the, the last frontier in Australia. It's um, very sparsely populated. And um, we're going to, well, we've t I'm going to talk about a project that looks at some options for sustainability uh, and the management of these animals. So it's the Brahmin uh, cattle, which is a main um, rangeland um, industry across northern Australia. And I'm presenting on behalf of a, a large project team from um, a particularly Beck Runting, so a lot of this work is hers, uh, and colleagues from CSIRO and Deakin University and University of Melbourne. Uh, no. All right. Okay. So the Northern Australian frontier is about 2 million uh, square kilometres in area. Its uh, climate ranges from tropical to semi-arid. Uh, it's very highly seasonal, so half the year is drought and half of the year is floods. The soils are very nutrient uh, poor, uh, diverse savanna and woodland through to forest ecosystems, and beef grazing occurs over roughly about 60% of the area. And it accounts for about 80% of Australia's live exports, which, and Australia's live exports are about 12% of global uh, trade in, in beef. Uh, it's uh, grassy savannas subject to fire each year or, or every couple of years, and also floods, as I mentioned there, the Flinders Gilbert, which you can see from space. Tourism is huge, so Kakadu National Park here and the um, uh, Catherine Gorge in the Kimberley. As I mentioned, livestock uh, grazing on savanna grasslands there. And there's also pockets of irrigation, so that's the Ord Irrigation District. Um, biodiversity, uh, there's, there's lots of iconic species, the saltwater crocodiles, and also a bunch of invasives. Uh, that's the cane toad. Uh, there's also buffalo, wild boar, uh, and a range of other uh, invasive species that are threatening the ecology. Indigenous land management, so that's uh, uh, burning there, fire stick burning, and uh, uranium mining and a range of other mining uh, industries, so that's uh, the Ranger uranium mine right in the middle of Kakadu National Park, set to close down in uh, a short period of time. And there's also endemic uh, disadvantage, particularly amongst indigenous communities, but uh, unusually for Australia, there's a bipartisan agreement that we want to develop the region. So our aims were to actually say, well, how can we do this more sus sustainably? If we're going to develop it, let's look for options, land management options to more sustainably manage the development. So it's one of these rare opportunities where we have a frontier development and we have the opportunity to do the science underpinning the better management uh, outlooks for it. So we did some integrated modelling of sustainable management options to 2050. So there's uh, a range of global scenarios which influence uh, what happens locally. There's uh, three climate models, five management scenarios, and I'll go through those in a bit more detail shortly. And also we looked at sustainability over five indicators. So livelihoods, so people's uh, economic returns, uh, beef production, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, conservation, and also land degradation. So we built a model that looked at the dynamics over space and time. So this is a one square kilometre grid cell uh, model and an annual time step. And here are our sustainability outcomes. And a range of uh, scenario parameters affect those sustainability outcomes. So for, from the environmental effects here, from rainfall and temperature, and wildfire affects biodiversity, affects uh, uh, pasture growth and therefore livestock production. It affects greenhouse gas emissions through fire. Uh, and also the uh, economic 
uh, uh, scenarios. So think parameters like livestock price trends and global demand, farm costs, productivity, growth, and also carbon prices are very influential. So they affect profits. And this key element here, livestock production, has complex interlinkages. So the more livestock you produce, it influences biodiversity through grazing. It influences greenhouse gas emissions through uh, the metabolism of the animals. That influences profit through a carbon price. Livestock influences profit because they sell the animals on the market and, and also influences land degradation because the more cattle you have, the more grass they eat and the more exposed the soil becomes. These management actions also influence our outcome. So if we improve pastures by adding fertilizer, that influences all uh, sorts of biodiversity, production, profit. Uh, stocking rates you can adjust. You can adjust the stocking rate to be more manageable. Uh, can, you can do control burning or you can do dietary supplementation. We link together a, a range of different models. The climate, fire models, land condition and biodiversity models. So biodiversity in particular involved the distribution of 1,677 vertebrate species. Uh, past, how we modelled how pastures grow, how livestock consume and produce the pasture, and then the economic model into livelihoods. I won't go too much into the uh, scenario definitions, but the important things here are they're linked to the RCPs, uh, and we're looking at livestock demand changes and also uh, carbon prices. So these were some of the key influences. Uh, the land management involves a range of stocking rate combinations, dietary supplements, whether you control the burning uh, to reduce carbon and, uh, and how you manage the pasture. So these combinations of different um, actions. And now, of course, with almost all of these types of studies, the results are complicated. There's no clear winner. Uh, there's a, a series of trade-offs, and this is a classic uh, conservation slash production trade-off. So here's our counterfactual. So we're doing, uh, running through our current land management into the future. And here's our management um, uh, treatments. And these are the, the global scenarios, the global outlooks. So you can see that by doing a conservation focus, of course we, and here's our legend here, so blue is beef production. We've got no beef production because we destock. So that improves um, our greenhouse gas emissions, it gives us less profit because we're only trading carbon now. We're not selling beef. Uh, our biodiversity is improved compared to, to the uh, counterfactual. Uh, and also the land conditions improve because you don't have cattle grazing anymore. And then follow that through. We've got a balanced, um, uh, uh, which is much more about the uh, production. Um, production, of course, you've got improved land condition, improved production improve profit, but the environmental indicators uh, don't perform so well. Uh, so we, we, we can't simultaneously maximise all of these uh, uh, sustainability indicators. So we have to make a hard choice. This is just the M3 uh, central scenario with one climate model, and it looks at the uh, combination of uh, indicators at their current condition, and then the change. So here's a change in baseline, and then the changes according to the uh, management actions. So there were three other cl climate models and uh, four other uh, outlooks. So there's 12 of these um, outcomes that we need to look across and look at the uh, costs and benefits. So you can see that these, uh, I'm not going to go into the sort of patterns over space and time, but of course, uh, it's complicated. So some areas improve, other areas decline, and that happens um, differentially depending on the indicator you're looking at and the um, management treatment. So it's a really uh, complex set of circumstances and decision criteria that we need to start to understand how, they, uh, how management influences um, uh, the sustainability outcomes over space and time. But it just in general, the conclusion is a classic conservation slash production trade-off. Livestock production is the key to livelihoods in the north. Even with a cracking good carbon price, we still can't offset the, the incomes from uh, trading uh, these things onto a, a live uh, export market. And we need innovation is 
uh, to, to improve multiple sustainability outcomes simultaneously. Things like seaweed uh, supplementation, which, which can uh, reduce carbon emissions from uh, uh, cattle by you know, uh, an order of magnitude, sort of 90%. Uh, and we need all these things. So we need to do all of the things we know about and more that we don't know about yet. We need to innovate in order to improve those um, uh, indicators simultaneously and global change adds another complexity dimension onto that and with that thank you for your time It's a low percentage of people, so there might only be some dozens of properties, because the properties might be as big as Switzerland. Um, uh, an individual farm would be that big, and so you might only be dealing with 30 families that, that cover 2 million kilometers, square kilometres, and so, so much. Well, that conservation one was, was all about indigenous land management, turning uh, existing cattle stations over to the indigenous communities and, and for them to burn it and their traditional... Uh, traditional and if they, what they do is they burn it early in the season and there's less... more grass that gets burned and less forest, so you're actually keeping more carbon in the landscape. Um, yeah, so that suits them. I probably glossed over that, but there was one in there where it was called a safe stocking rate. So yeah. that was a, a stocking rate, which uh, is the amount of animals per hectare, which eat around 25% of the savanna biomass. And so anything above that, you're risking exposure of the soil and erosion and things like that. So that's safe stocking rate. In some areas, they do higher rates than that. In some areas, lower. So you're sort of bringing it all to that, that rate. So, yeah, sorry about that. So, uh, yes, we haven't really gone, uh, this hasn't really been a stakeholder driven process. It's been more uh, an exploratory process to see what sort of uh, actions would make the big sorts of difference. We do work with people who are based in the territory and, and uh, who work as scientists with stakeholders, but we haven't actually done any uh, participatory work yet. We we'll sort of leave that for sort of later stages once we we know a bit more about the system. Um, look, I don't know a lot about it, but there's some experimental work up at um, one of the um, Australian uh, university universities in Northern Australia um, that has done some experimental work on feeding seaweed, kelp to cattle, and the emissions have declined by about 90%. So, I don't, I don't know, I, I haven't seen the papers, and I don't know if it's published, but I've just seen it at, in uh, sort of popular media, and the guy might be a, a crackpot, and it might be all, all um, rubbish, but I'm not sure. But it's, it, it was the kind of um, innovative, uh, step change that we kind of need to, to shock the system into a more sustainable state. Definitely a great question. And I think there'll be a session this afternoon on transformative or innovative farms and sustainability. So yeah, yeah. I encourage you to head to that one. Um, next up, we have the yeah. from the large scale to an even larger scale. Uh, work and analysis okay. uh, from Michael.
So that's okay. That's pretty out. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for showing up. Uh, I'm going to talk about the results uh, from a global meta-analysis. Uh, there was a, the outcome of a succinct IDIF and UZ funded uh, synthesis project going on over the last years. All of those people here have contributed uh, a lot to that meta-analysis and some of them are actually here. Um, and I'd like to start with a very broad question, a question I think is basically capturing a lot of the motivation why we are here at this conference and what drives us in our research here. How do we optimize land use in, in order to secure the production of goods while also protecting biodiversity at the same time? And uh, I mean, you can phrase it many different ways. And one way a colleague who's also here uh, uh, suggested once was like, uh, you mean like, how do we get what we want without screwing everything else up? Uh, except he didn't say screw, but anyhow, you get the gist. So uh, over the last years, we've seen a lot of scientific debates on the food security, on the sharing, sparing debate. I think also the, uh, the giving half of the planet back to nature discussion is kind of motivated uh, against this backdrop. So um, what we know is that land use intensification is really a big driver of species loss. We, for example, here the predicts uh, project, we find tremendous losses in species richness, in uh, abundances uh, all, all over the planet, all over, over different production systems. So that seems to be a general trend. But what we don't know actually is how does this um, relate to what we get out of um, uh, uh, intensifying land, uh, land use. Uh, it's not something, uh, land use intensification, that happens just for the fun of it. We do it as humans to actually gain more yields, get more out of the land. So, and we thought that what might be a nice question to ask in a meta-analysis. And, uh, but first, we have to think about how do we uh, investigate land use intensification. And for that, we first have to think about how to classify um, land use in a way that we can compare it across the globe and also across different production systems. So what we did was uh, we looked into the three most important production systems, uh, crop production, fodder or livestock keeping, and uh, wood production in forests, and identified um, how these uh, systems can be described with low, medium, or high intensity of land use. And of course, there's several examples I can give you. You can chop down a forest with an ax or take out a few logs with an ax or you can chop it down completely with a, with a harvester. There seems to be a gradient of land use intensity here, I think. And of course, the same goes for st stocking densities in uh, fodder systems or pesticide application in crop systems. And of course, there are many, many more factors you can take into account to classify systems according to their intensity of land use. And that's what we did and uh, we, uh, use those initial um, classes of intensity to uh, identify steps of intensification. So for our meta-analysis, an intensification, for example, could happen within one low intensity system or medium or high. And the same goes for if you think about you intensify a little bit more, then uh, you reach uh, the next level of intensity and so on and so on. And of course, there will also be the, uh, the immediate step from low to high. And we classified all the studies we looked at uh, in the same way, so we made them comparable across uh, all of the different studies. We use species richness as a response for uh, biodiversity and mass per area uh, for yields. And we looked at really lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of papers. Uh, I'm gonna spare you the details. This is what we started with, and this is what we ended up with. It's pretty depressing, actually, but we found quite a good uh, distribution across the globe, different biomes, and uh, we were also a bit frustrated about how people reported uh, data in papers, so this is a byproduct of this frustration. So uh, check it out if you're interested in that. And quickly coming directly to the results, what did we find? So overall, over all these different production systems and over all these steps of intensification, small ones, intermediate ones, and the large ones, we find uh, about 20% increase in yield caused by land use intensification uh, here in red. 
and uh, a richness change uh, a loss uh, about 9%. So it's actually to be expected, I guess. And if we take that apart a bit and look at different aspects of that intensity, for example, just looking at uh, the um, intensification of low systems, so basically this, this, and this arrow, um, we see that within low intensity systems, intensification doesn't really do anything. And uh, we see a significant drop in, uh, in, in, in species numbers in the low to medium uh, intensification, and we see a significant increase in yield starting at, uh, um, in the low to high intensification. And if you look at the medium intensity system, we find surprisingly that within medium intensity intensification, uh, leads to the highest encountered uh, increase in yield for our study here for this meta-analysis. It's about 85% increase in yield and also the highest loss in species, about 25% of species lost. And similar pattern here for medium to high, and again similar uh, for high to high, but not as pronounced as for the medium medium. So um, if we take that apart a little bit further and look at the different uh, production systems separately, we find that uh, in the wood production systems, um, we have a significant increase in yield through intensification, or we don't find any effect on uh, biodiversity. And that doesn't really separate uh, out through looking at the individual groups of species we, we looked at. In crop production systems, on the other hand, we find, again, an increase in, in yield, but also a signi significant loss in uh, species numbers, which is largely attributed to the strong response of plant species in these cropping systems. And for, uh, for green fodder, we find uh, the same general pattern that l drops uh, losses of uh, biodiversity or species numbers, but no significant actually, actually no significant increase in yield in those systems. And we have a lot of variation in these studies over here, so we cannot really uh, say anything specific about that. So what to take home from that? So the initial question, what is the simultaneous effect of land use? Uh, of uh, intensification uh, on species richness and production? Well, of course, it's a boring, it depends answer. We find stuff like, in many cases, uh, land use intensification uh, leads to a loss of species. I think that's really important. This is really uh, the, the major pattern. We don't find, for example, uh, um, instances where we have a win-win. So an increase of both yields and richness caused by intensification. So that seems to be quite improbable, although it has been debated in the literature quite a lot. Um, wood production systems seem to be the least negatively affected when it comes to biodiversity changes, while plants seem to be generally more, most vulnerable from, those, uh, from the set of, uh, of studies. Um, and also, again, the greatest gains we find for yield uh, can be achieved in medium intensity systems by int intensifying those, but also they come at the highest price in terms of biodiversity loss. So to conclude, um, I think the main story here might be actually that we really need more studies that probably report those three aspects. A intensification effects on um, biodiversity and yield and measure that and report that. I think this is really crucial to get a better understanding uh, of this whole relationship. Um, we also see that there's some kind of hope. Conventional intensification can actually, if it's carried out in small steps, increase yield without cost, uh, causing uh, species richness loss. But we really have to dig deep into the systems where this is actually possible. It's not this meta-analysis doesn't tell where this happens. It just tells us that it's possible. And I think it's really crucial that we find um, out what are the circumstances uh, that make those uh, changes possible. For example, South Saharan Africa, low input systems might be a good place to start looking into that. And we also see that also high intensity systems contain biodiversity that can be lost through further intensification. I think this is really crucial that the research community focuses a, a bit more in the future on areas that uh, used for production because they are, these areas are not irrelevant for biodiversity. And I think it's really important that we are not getting uh, 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 losing track of that. 
So with that, I'd like to th conclude and thank these people. The paper is out now. Uh, uh, it was a really fun time uh, doing this project. And yeah, if you're into tweeting, please use Ralph's <laughs> handle. I'm, I, I'm, I'm out of that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. something that I've always had oh, no. as, well, as well, finding this, <laughs> finding this data. Thank you. We have lots of questions. Um, we'll go for the first down the front. Hey, I think it's a really great talk. Thanks. Um, so I noticed that plants consistently have greater effect sizes and um, broader confidence intervals surrounding yep. them. Why, why, why such a high variance around I think it really depends on uh, the types of studies we uh, uh, included in the meta-analysis. They are quite varied, uh, uh, ranging from all different kinds of climates and systems across the globe. And uh, it's not easy to um, give like a, a, a one straightforward answer to why uh, plants or vertebrates responded more or less to that. It, re it really depends on the whole background of the, of the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I was wondering, you know, what's the absolute change in biodiversity? Because there I would expect that the, the difference gets even bigger and that at high intensity you're, not, you're losing, you know, from 8 to, to 60, yeah. whereas at low to... Well, of, of course, it all, always comes down back to that we try to compare apples and oranges, and the... Uh, the systems are so varied in terms of the numbers of species we encounter in the low and the high intensity system. The only way to uh, we thought of to compare them meaningfully is by converting it to uh, response ratios. Uh, so the absolute changes are pr completely different, but they wouldn't uh, be interpretable in this whole uh, uh, very summarized way. It's, it's all over the board, I would say. It's, uh, it's quite uh, a mess. Uh, yeah, uh, we can look into the data maybe in a break. Well, I mean, the, the, the papers basically had to contain uh, three levels of information. Uh, so we wanted to have a, like a treatment in terms of land use, so a low and a high intensity of use, some kind of difference in, in this treatment. And they had to measure the response of some group of biodiversity or several or uh, and um, some yield on, on those areas. So. Um, this could include uh, experimental farms, for example, as you suggest, but this could also be uh, yeah, experiments that are focusing more on biodiversity, but that also measure yields uh, as basically a byproduct. And what is the landscape? No, it's, it's, it's not a landscape scale analysis. It's really containing uh, the data, the yields from the, uh, from the actual sites and not some kind of... Uh, uh, aggregated uh, county level data on yields or anything like that. To uh, the second question, as I recall it, we didn't have any uh, studies included that addressed those uh, types of uh, agriculture specifically. It's definitely a drawback. So it's just row crops that you're looking at? It's crops, it's uh, biomass uh, for livestock keeping or biomass for, for wood production. It's, uh, that's basically mass per area. And um, so it's not, it's not about the actual uh, 
economic yields or anything. That's, that, that would be nice, but next level, you know. <laughs> uh, okay, the first question, um, as you describe it, I think you have a, you, you describe a farm perspective uh, which we didn't take. We t took basically a plot perspective. So if you grow in a farm uh, bananas and uh, cacao, for example, on two different sites, and you have a low intensity banana pr production and a, low intens a high intensity banana production and a low and high intensity cacao production, those will be two separate cases for our meta-analysis because those are not interlinked. But of course, in the whole aspect of the revenue for the farm, this is a completely different story. So we are just looking about changes in mass of yield and changes in species numbers on the same places at the same time. So hope that. One very quick last question and a quick last answer before we change over. Maybe it's a quick question. I hope the answer is also quick. Um, when you said you were surprised about the medium medium results, you probably have thought of how to explain it. Is there a specific farming system, specific crop systems, or is it specific reasons in which this medium to medium intensification occurs and that may help to explain why the results are this? Uh, it's, n it's none of those factors you just suggested, but I think uh, one explanation is actually the design of the, of the meta-analysis. We m might have ended up by creating this classification to skew too many different aspects of intensity and the medium class. That's one possible explanation. But um, there, yeah, it could just be that the medium intensity used systems on average on a global scale from the studies we, we synthesized they are actually containing um, the most potential for small intensification steps to actually increase the yields, but it comes at the same, at the highest cost. I don't know, that's just also possible. But yeah, we can maybe, maybe look at, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in the break, talk about that. Yeah, um, hello everybody. I'm, um, I'm happy that I'm presenting this just after this interesting talk because this is a, a case study again showing um, trade-off between ecology, economic, this kind of uh, traditional trade-off. But I hope um, that uh, I will convince you or I will uh, show you how to mitigate such trade-off or at least this is what we try to do in an experiment of biodiversity enrichment in OPAM in, in Sumatra, Indonesia. And uh, this project is part of a large uh, interdisciplinary research project um, collaboration between University of Göttingen and uh, different universities in Indonesia, Jambi, and uh, Bogo Agricultural University. And I'm going to present you the very preliminary results of an interdisciplinary project with many people uh, collaborating. And um, this is, as I said, preliminary. I'm very happy to get feedbacks, critics, comments, and um, yeah. Um, so this, um, this is a view of all palm plantation in, in Sumatra in our study site uh, in Jami province. But this is kind of typical of the landscape in this region and even um, in other countries such as Malaysia. You probably know that Indonesia and Malaysia together produce 80% of the all palms. And it's not only localized in Southeast Asia, but also in Colombia. Um, Cameroon and, and many more countries, it's, it's expanding with um, increasing the global demand. Um, so um, here we see um, a view from a, that was taken from terrestrial laser scan, and we see clearly that there is a drastic reduction in the structural complexity of um, the land use from very complex and dense vegetation in, um, this is a national park in, in Jambi, and here an all OPA monoculture uh, with very low understory. And our colleague, uh, Jan Klaff, published an interesting paper on summarizing um, the effects on ecosystem functions. And no surprise, most of the uh, functions that he included in the analysis are drastically reduced by converting forests to all palm. 
Um, the only function that remains is the harvested biomass, basically uh, people extracting the opium fruits to produce the oil, which is then used for biofuel and the um, industry, cosmetic and so on. So um, the question is how do we deal with this situation and is there a way to improve the balance and, um, and to find an opium dominated landscape that can uh, host some kind of biodiversity but at the same time keep this uh, economic benefits because um, in this region about 40% of the opium is actually cultivated by smallholders. So this really is a source of income for local population and um, so there is an urgent need to find, to find some solutions. Um, this is a paper quite um, some time ago but I think it's still valid on um, what kind of landscape could, we could design to build such such, um, such system in the future. So basically they suggest to have agroforestry zones by combining native trees, multiple species, um, together with natural regeneration, in particular zones that allow to protect the, um, the, the natural areas and to create buffer zones, to create corridors. And the question of course is what are the, the, the trade-offs and how to mitigate them because uh, there is very little empirical knowledge on such system so far. So we um, have established an experiment in, um, about five years ago in Jambi uh, in a conventional open plantation and uh, you see here these squares actually represent our experimental plots and um, we planted uh, native tree species, um, six species here that are used for multiple purposes and the idea is that these trees are planted very densely in, in so-called uh, so islands, some kind of um, restricted area that are located far away from each other, like around 80 meters. And this follows the concept of tree islands that basically we um, improve biodiversity in, in, in spots that can later on expand over time if we decide to transform the, the landscape into restoration or even leaving it uh, with a, a productive opium in the surrounding but they can still um, improve the biodiversity at the landscape scale while it's covering only 2% of, of the plantation. So this is uh, how the experiment looked like um, in, the, um, in the last year. So it's a view from a drone where you see different species and uh, some of the trees already reach considerable height up to, up to um, 15 or, or even 20 meters, oops, already um, overgrowing the, um, the height of the palms. Oops, sorry. And we see some signs of biodiversity coming with uh, some nests and a lot of uh, bird singing. We also see some, um, some changes in the, in the litter, in the uh, grass layers and so on. So as I said, it's a large interdisciplinary project. I'm just going to present you today some of the aspects because uh, it's preliminary, it's ongoing research. And um, the, um, the first thing that we did is using a laser scanning to measure the structural complexity because we know that structural complexity is linked to, for example, microclimate stability or habitats for biodiversity. And we found that uh, three years after planting, we have a significant um, improvement or increase in structural complexity um, where trees were planted, this is um, our experimental plots, compared to the OPA monoculture. And uh, it's, we are of course far away from the comp complexity found in forest because forest has much more vertical structure and, um, and uh, yeah, after three years we could not reach this level. But that's already a good sign I think that we achieve have a restoration of, of the structure. Um, on the short term. The impact um, on biodiversity of different taxa, so species richness and also ecosystem functions. Um, so in red you see all palm monoculture, this is our control plots. Um, here in green it's basically our experimental plot where no trees were planted, so we, we just opened the area, we fenced it and we uh, stopped any kind of herbicides or um, chemical applications. Um, and here in blue, these two um, classes here, they are our experimental plots with tree planting. And uh, the, light, the light blue is uh, one species planted and the dark blue is uh, multiple species, so two to six. Um, so basically what we see so far is that we have a clear effect on 
uh, above ground biodiversity. Um, also shown is um, the recovery of the natural regeneration with increasing number of seeds arriving. We have also done a survey of um, spontaneous trees. We have about 30 new species that established spontaneously. Most of them are, are natives. Um, no effect so far on below ground, at least in terms of uh, richness. Um, in terms of ecosystem functions, the response is much more clear. Uh, most of the, the functions we've investigated have a clear net effect. Um, of course, wood production because the trees grow, they produce leaves. Um, we also have an improvement of the soil fertility, which is quite uh, surprising because in our plots, as I said, we, we stopped any kind of fertilizer application. So this is all just due to the natural processes, probably due to the nitrogen fixing um, species, that, species that we planted also improvement on water infiltration, which has benefits. As we know, in all time, there is a lot of problem with the water cycle, with drought during dry season and flooding during wet season. So this is a, already a good, um, a good sign. In terms of um, all time yields, so I'm not going into too much of detail here, but I just would like to mention that we actually in, in, um, incorporated the fact that some of the pumps have been cut to give light for the, um, and space for the trees to grow, but this were um, taken into account in an in a expansion factor methods that we basically scale up the, um, all the yield of individual oil palms to a standardized area, which we then compare to a control plot uh, to control oil palm yields. And this is what is shown here. Basically, that's the, the zero is the um, comparison to the plantation average. And most of the... Um, so the, the color here indicates the number of species that were planted. And in most of the case, we see a clear decline, except in the zero species plot here, where we found improvement of a, a net gain in all palm yields. And again, this is, a, this is a, a, quite a good sign and a, a potential um, cost um, effective um, alternative to uh, agroforestry. So um, to summarize, what we've so found so far is that the planting of uh, trees in all palm improves structural complexity, biodiversity, ecosystem functions, and reduces all palm yields. So there is a clear trade-off. But the results I've shown you so far are, are, are local. So uh, just looking at what's happening in our plots, but we need to scale this up at the landscape and see the net effects. Um, I also didn't show you here the effect of diversity, which, which will be another dimension to consider. And of course, um, the uh, planted trees have also benefits as they produce fruits and can be used for um, education as well. Example. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Um, yeah, that's of course a good question. The impact of the surrounding landscape matrix, that's something we want to do um, in, the, in the next month. And I mean, the landscape is really all palm dominated. It's, I don't exactly remember, but more than 80% in the th thousands of hectares surrounding the experiment, it's just all palm monoculture. So we have very little fragments left. Uh, we do have some isolated trees that still provide some shelters and, and some benefits for the, the, the biodiversity. Um, so that might explain, for example, for the bird or the bats, but um, in terms of insects, we do not know yet um, where this biodiversity comes from, if it's uh, species that are commonly found in the plantation that just accumulate or whether they come from, from the surrounding forest. But that's definitely an interesting question to consider. Uh, 
uh, you mean in the conventional open transition? I'm, I'm not sure. No. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. How do you see the um, Actually, here this is like a, the total uh, plant in the understory. So we just look at all individuals that were found in a, in a certain area. And altogether, there was no, no clear effect. Actually, it was even surprising that the richness in the conventional palm is so high. But this is probably because um, the, um, um, the PT Humusindo, which is the company where we establish our experiment, it's not as intensive as other huge plantation. And probably the picture would be different if we would have done this experiment in, in another uh, plantation. And it also depends very much on the management, so um, most of the time they uh, cut manually. So, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of not really high intensified plantation. And again, this is the, the total uh, plant number, but if we um, split the herbaceous and shrubs and trees here, we find a, a clear effect with um, high diversity of trees and shrubs compared to the old palm with mainly um, grasses and in invasive shrubs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of invasive plants also. Um, last question. More a comment. Well, thank you for the interesting study. Uh, if I understand well, the trees were planted in specific locations on the pots. Yes. Not, okay, not in a full oil palm as a portion system. Exactly, that's the idea. Um, why not, first? Yeah. And second, there are some very interesting experiments going on with oil palm in the gold forestry systems in um, Para in northern Brazil. Okay. And they are doing some studies on uh, both environmental but also socio economic outcomes. It could be interesting. Yeah, definitely. Maybe you can catch uh, talk about this later. Just about your question. Um, so uh, this is the idea of, of tree islands, or sometimes people call it applied nuclei or island woodlets. Um, so it's basically uh, the idea that by having these very dense and sparse islands in the landscape that we uh, have an overall positive effect on the landscape scale and we do not drastically uh, impact the economic or the, the productivity because it's only here uh, 2% that's, um, that's kind of uh, typical up to 4%. Sometimes um, we, f we find it in, in similar uh, approaches, for example, to restore pasture, abundant pasture in, in America. Some people use it there. So it's, it's really the idea it's supposed to be more cost effective because it reduces the planting um, cost, the management cost, but also uh, the opportunity cost because you, you still leave a lot of space for agricultural productivity. Okay, oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, cool. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Maximilian Meyer. I'm from the University of Bonn, uh, from the Institute of Food and Resource Economics. Um, and this work is uh, also been, been done by Jan Berner, who is my supervisor, and Vladimir Wingate of the University of Basel. So today I would like to present you some first insights and the results of the impact of community-based conservation on elephant counts and vegetation cover in Namibia's Zambezi region. So as time is scarce, let's get right into it. Uh, I would like to give you a little bit of an orientation of the study area. So what we see is this red, that's the Zambezi region of Namibia. And it's, as the title says, embedded within the Casa TFCA, so the Kavango Zambezi Trans Frontier Conservation Area. Probably a lot of you have heard about it already. It's the second large or world's second largest trans frontier conservation area. And the background is to uh, revert undesired impacts of restricted wildlife movement, this whole thing about fences and fines and national borders. 
What you also see are these green striped uh, things. That's, those are the Namibian community conservancies. So in Namibia, conservancies have been established since the 1990s, 1990s, mainly to reconcile wildlife conservation and rural development. So use and management rights uh, of, of wildlife are granted to the communities on this communal land. So that's kind of the main mechanism um, and a widely discussed approach to solve the tragedy of the commons in this uh, yeah, common pool resource um, situation. Um, yeah, to date, till today, this has become an integral part of managing wildlife throughout Namibia, um, where for over 50% of communal land has been attributed conservational status. So wildlife conservation is the primary purpose of these conservancies and benefit sharing is kind of the mean for participating households to gain additional cash or also in, in kind income. So why is this area so interesting? Why is the Zambezi region so interesting? Because additionally to this, what I just uh, told you, we also observe dynamic land use change uh, in this area, also by our colleague Vladimir Wingate, but also by others like, such as uh, Kamui and others. So our question is, or the research question is, what role have uh, community conservancies played in this local land use change and what have elephants to do with this? So let's get right into it. some descriptive statistics. What we see is the development of average woodland cover change per pixel. Um, this is also the match data set that, so we can guarantee good comparability. How we derive this, I'll explain uh, to you in two slides. Uh, so we see downward trend from 1984 to 90, uh, 2009. And after that, um, it increases again and we also have treated pixels, which are the, con the conservancy pixels and non-treated pixels. What we also included is the years when a conservancy was established. So these gray lines are conservancy establishment and each number corresponds to, to one conservancy. So in 1998, Salambala was, um, was established, which is, uh, the, yeah, I think the second oldest conservancy throughout Namibia. So this graph is there to facilitate our research background and the motivation of the role that community conservancies have played in this development. Uh, let us now have a look uh, how we want to evaluate the role of the community conservancies. So what we do is we base our work on a socio-ecological framework that has been developed by, by Ostrom and Maskia, further by Maskia. Uh, we use this framework to identify uh, variables that cr control for rival explanation when we do our um, estimation to avoid estimation bias. We were able to control for pretty much each section that you see here, um, and we see, we see later the, the list of variables that we have. So what we should do is we should start at the bottom. This is our outcome. Uh, so, so the question is what has changed this outcome and how has it been changed? So have conservancies despite their aim of wildlife conservation, maybe despite is not the correct word for it, but anyway, have they also changed woodland cover? And also have conservancies, so that's this one, and have conservancies also helped in keeping elephant um, uh, counts constant. Uh, and what we also see is the, the, the impact pathway, which is the conservancy area. This can be split a little bit more into type of management zones because they have management zones and implementation or enforcement of these management zones, but we're not gonna get into this much detail now. Um, so, let's have a look. First thing to make clear, we work on a pixel basis as our observation. Uh, the identification strategy is our mean with which we use observational data to approximate a, a real experiment, kind of as of random, because of course the treatment, the conserva conservancy has not been generated in, uh, r randomly. For this, we use nearest neighbor matching, which gives a probability of being treated to each pixel given uh, the specific covariates. We can then compare very similar pixels as each conservancy pixel now has a very similar control pixel. Um, this then generated a matched data set, one-to-one. -one. We then test our models for time, 
individu individual effects as well of, uh, as well as autocorrelation and heteroskedasticity to check which specification you should use. This then resulted in a fixed effects model and we want to estimate three models. These are shown here. Uh, first, we estimate the effect of a conservancy, which is the C, as kind of the treatment. You could have also called it T, but C is nice because it's conservancy on woodland cover. So Y is our outcome, which is woodland cover. Second, we estimate the effect of conservancy and elephants on woodland cover. Elephants is E. And then at uh, last, we estimate all of these effects plus an interaction term, which shows the specific effect of elephants in a conservancy, kind of a heterogeneous treatment effect. So this is the data. It's not all that we would use. It's still preliminary work, but this gives you an overview uh, together with the sources. So outcomes woodland cover as percentage woodland cover in a 300 by 300 meter grid cell by our colleague uh, Vladimir Wingate. These are the treatment variables, then time variant covariates and time invariant covariates. Um, yeah, we have some distances to roads, national parks, travel distance, fire, population, etc. And this is what came out. Here we see the model output of the three described equations, our dependent variables again, woodland cover. Um, so equation one uh, is conservancy treatment only uh, for the t eight time periods from 84 to 2017, um, which shows, uh, so w we can actually interpret this as a, um, as a per percentage change of the dependent variables, so woodland cover, given this received treatment of conservancy establishment. So this would be a roughly 5% woodland cover increase. Uh, the same applies to two and three. Um, the treatment effect of the conservancy is more pronounced with 9% woodland cover change, but this is given the restricted time period. Because this is restricted because we only have elephant data in this time period, right? Um, the elephant presence is kind of a bin binary variable, which also increases woodland cover. And then the interaction term implies the effect that elephant presence has within a conservancy, which is also strongly significant. So one could ask, do we see woodland cover increase because elephants are present, or do we have elephants in more woody areas? The, the latter explanation refers to some kind of reverse causality, and maybe more closed areas are preferred by the elephants due to the protection. So this hypothesis is uh, supported by some supplementing regressions that we have run and that predict elephant presence. So in this regression, the conservancy as such did not affect and uh, have an effect on woodland, but the woodland cover itself had this highly significant effect. And there we go to a summary, real quick. This increase in woodland cover in the Zambezi region within the last decade, also found by other authors, can be partially attributed to increased community conservancy establishment this positive effect, um, uh, this positive impact has also an effect on elephant occurrence. These findings are supported by, for example, Robin Naidu from WUWF. Some of you have, might have heard of them. So, and what I think is really, really interesting, um, we can also state that our idea of the causal mechanism has changed from the former to the latter. Um, first, we thought that through elephants, community conservancies may alter the woodland cover like this. But what we see is that because conservancies have higher woodland cover increase, elephants tend to stay more in these areas, reverse causality thingy. And then, so this, we see this mechanism here. First, conservancies increase woodland cover, and this woodland cover increases the elephant presence. Um, and these are other conclusions that you can read for yourself, because time's up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Quick questions. Sorry. Um, this, because, um, so what we said, what is, so si elephants are significant in changing woodland cover, but when we run the, the other way around, so what determines elephant presence is not actually the, the conservancy, but the, 
but the woodland cover itself, right? So this is this was our hypothesis because where you have more elephants, you probably have they they probably destroy trees or whatever this has been shown, but the, we thought this doesn't make really oh, well from from our regression this wasn't shown because um, we couldn't really see um, oh, the woodland cover was higher oh no sorry uh, so we have <laughs> community conservancy uh, which has g generates higher woodland cover yeah and then this attracts the elephants if we want to determine what de de or if you want to see what determines elephant presence that is what is actually not significant is the community conservancy but the woodland cover right that's okay Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm here to present results on an effort to map opportunities for forest restoration in the Mato Grosso state in the Brazilian Amazon. Um, so first, uh, I'm focusing on the, uh, on the share of the state of Mato Grosso that is located within the borders of the uh, Amazon biome. And uh, Mato Grosso State is a Negro business powerhouse. It's the leading, or if not the leading, the second le leader, uh, leading uh, producer of many of the most important uh, agricultural commodities in Brazil, such as soybean, maize, cotton, livestock, and, and meat, uh, of course, uh, for, um, for exportation. And, uh, but also, is, uh, uh, Mato Grosso accounts for a large share of deforestation in the Amazon, 33% to be more precise, which uh, sum up, sums up to 20 million hectares of clear-cut deforestation. So here I have a map showing, oh, showing the spatial distribution of deforestation across the state and uh, uh, land uses. So uh, the widespread deforestation has implications, not only environmental and ecological, which are very serious, but also legal implication for uh, legal implications for landholders. For, for example, uh, according to the Brazilian Forest Code, there is a deficit of 3.4 million hectares uh, uh, in legal reserves inside private properties. This was calculated by, uh, uh, by us in another study that's under review. And um, just to clarify, legal reserves are a protection category uh, inside private properties in uh, Brazil, established by the Forest Code and they are basically a share of the property that has to be set aside for a conservation. So um, here I have to the right, sorry, a map showing the spatial distribution of this deficit on a property scale. And um, uh, Mato Grosso is expecting to leverage from this uh, opportunity, from the opportunities on forest restoration that uh, might be created by the enforcement of the Brazilian Forest Code. So the state has targeted to, uh, risk to recover 2.9 me million hectares of forests uh, statewide by 2030, which is aligned with the national and international restoration committees such as the Bond Challenge and the uh, Plan Aveg, which is the national plan for native vegetation recovery. And uh, 1.9 million hectares of this uh, forest recovery is uh, planned to take place by via uh, legal reserve recovery inside private properties. But large scale forest uh, 
restoration implies in very high costs of implementation. So the questions that should be guiding allocation are, for example, where is it feasible to restore and uh, where can we achieve more gains in terms of uh, forest functions enhancement? So uh, to tackle this challenge, I propose, or we propose a multi-criteria analysis to map forest restoration priority areas given four criteria that represent two dimensions of forest restoration. Feasibility, represented by costs and the natural likelihood of uh, land abandonment followed by forest regrowth and forest functions enhancement here represented by carbon sequestration and habitat suitability enhancement. So I also consider in the allocation the spatial distribution of the forest deficits, of course, and I address two specific questions in this talk today, which are what are the benefits in terms of carbon sequestration and habitat enhancement and the costs in, term of, in terms of opportunity costs and direct restoration costs of restoring 2.0 zero million hectares of forest in Mato Grosso. I arbitrarily uh, took this uh, share to apply in this model. And how do benefits and costs of forest restoration, forest restoration differ in private and pu public lands? So here I have the restoration criteria which I used. I'm not sure about the time, but I'm uh, on the forest function side. So we uh, carbon enhancement is represented by above and below ground biomass. And a habitat enhancement, uh, we, um, estimated uh, habitat enhancement for 65 man ma mammal species uh, based on the landscape degradation level and the home range uh, spe species specific requirement. And on the other side, on the feasibility side, uh, we uh, calculate opportunity costs of agriculture based on uh, using land prices as a proxy and the likelihood of regeneration was modeled um, based on drivers of land abandonment and represented socioeconomic propensity of uh, long-term permanence of this uh, regrowing forest. So I used the zonation uh, prioritization software to integrate these four criteria. And I ran four scenarios, not scenarios, but four different setups assigning different weights to these criteria. I start from a, so I have time, okay. I start from a scenario <laughs> uh, uh, where I fully uh, prioritize habitat enhancement and I move on to a scenario where I uh, give equal weights to all the criteria. And then I compare costs and benefits of allocating this target, 1 million hectare to private lands and 1 million hectares uh, to uh, public lands, which here I have the different if I press this, okay. I have the different 10 year categories that are considered here. So, and I forgot to say that I'm uh, working on a regular grid cells of one hectare size. So here I have the result. Uh, on the left side, I have a map showing uh, pr uh, priority areas distribution across the, our study area. And we can see, we could identify uh, different, uh, different regional hotspots of priority. They are mostly located um, in highly deforested areas where, uh, where underrepresented species are located uh, due to habitat degradation. And uh, areas also in areas under less intensive use and in areas on the local level, areas of uh, high forest edge density. And to the right, I have the map showing the results for the equal weight scenario. I, you can see a shift towards uh, northwestern Mato Grosso because this is where uh, um, uh, opportunity costs are lower, but also you have lots of um, candidate, oh no, you have lots of areas with a high biomass uh, density value. So uh, yeah, so you, you, you can see the loss in strength of the other hotspots. Okay, so this graph is showing the results for the habitat uh, enhancement uh, criteria for the different, uh, for the uh, full, uh, for the scenario that fully prioritized biodiversity and the equal weight scenario. Uh, the size of the circles uh, reflects the home range sizes and the color reflects the accumulated deforestation per species. So the level of degradation that the geographical range of that species has. So you can see here that uh, fully prioritizing biodiversity had good uh, effects, positive effects in the increase in distribution for species that had um, very degraded uh, habitats. 
in the comparison to the equal weight scenario, which had uh, more uniform improvement across species. So here in these four plots, I show the results for each one of the four different setups. And you can see here that um, that's a very interesting result that restoration in private properties uh, with legal reserve uh, deficit had a bigger impact on habitat recovery for species with highly disturbed habitats. So for species that are less represented due to degradation, due to um, uh, high concentration of deforestation, you, uh, these private properties, restoration in private pro properties is very important. So here, uh, the results on the, the costs and on the carbon uh, mitigation. Uh, the equal weight uh, setup offers 23 uh, uh, a 23% reduction in costs compared to the equal weight of, compared to the full um, habitat enhancement prioritization scenario. I should just call it B100 instead of saying all these words. But anyways, and also. Uh, <laughs> Uh, restoration in public lands is cheaper than in uh, private lands, as expected. And um, the equal weight scenario also offers 27% uh, more carbon mitigation than the, the B100 scenario. Also, uh, with more potential for public lands than private lands. Here I have a, I, oh no, okay. I only have one slide more, so it's okay. But yeah. I can give more details later. So here I have the prices per uh, mitigation cost per ton of CO2 mitigated. So he, the equal weight is the most cost effective scenario. But most important, most gains in cost effectiveness would already be achieved by a scenario that gave 75% weight to the habitat suitability criteria. So implications and outlook, uh, the BFC enforcement the Brazilian Forest Code enforcement is key for increasing the representation of species in highly deforested areas along the deforestation arch. Restoration in public lands was more effective in reducing costs and mitigating, mitigating carbon. And for future research, there are lots of caveats to be addressed. This is also ongoing work. Um, uh, I aim to improve connectivity with Cerrado and uh, the other biome, the neighboring bi biome. And improve, especially improve species representation in the model. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your feedback. In the public lands? Yes. Okay, yeah, so uh, actually the state strategy in, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just randomly going back to the slides. The, 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 to the first question, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> to the first question, no, uh, this is uh, my PhD research, so it's just, um, it's just a model to try to uh, map the potential for restoration and try to take into account the trade-offs. So no, I haven't. Uh, been on the field to uh, address this, but there has been some research, and um, of course, for private landowners, the, the their natural propensity to restore and lose uh, productive space is never uh, very high. So that's why the state uh, plan, the restoration state plan, and uh, in, in also the national plan, is largely based on the enforcement of the law that already exists and that uh, requires that these uh, deficits are somehow uh, compensated either through restoration or compensation via per uh, um, um, trading uh, forest trade mechanisms. Uh, uh, forest title trade mechanisms. And concerning the second questions, I did the public versus private um, comparison just as an exercise as, as, an exercise as well because most, uh, I think that all the target, uh, restoration target by the state, it, it's, uh, it aims um, private lands. So there's a lot of uh, um, unknowns about the tenure uh, in land in, in, in the Amazon, especially in Brazil. So I even, um, 
here, for example, I, I, I showed the different tenure classes. And here, most of the land that was um, selected by our model in the public lands, which we call public, but we actually don't know, it's uh, on, uh, located on unknown tenure. So it could be either land that is private or occupied so, and so on. But I wanted to show the potential because the, the, the state has to somehow take care of this land and, uh, and we have to clarify the, this tenure situation and understand the potential. So that's answering to your question. Yeah? No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I forgot to add my no Bolsonaro questions slide, <laughs> but since I forgot, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's like for, <laughs> when I started my PhD, the scenario was one, and now that I'm finishing, it's like wow. But I, I since this is like the, there are several levels of policies taking place. This is on. A, I'm doing this work for Mato Grosso and the state level policy. I still hope that there is a chance for, like, with the international pressure and um, because this is also a commit commitment made at the Paris um, conference, and then I still have hopes, but, like, it's so uncertain right now, so I can't really, <laughs> I don't know. But I don't think that the prospects are very nice. We should just do our work and show <laughs> why it has to be done, so, yeah. Possible yeah. and then <laughs> we can tailor it to whenever you, you publish it. <laughs> yeah. Any other quick questions while we go over? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't include this. Uh, I, uh, this analysis shows uh, restoration as a net cost uh, venture, but it can also be there. There can also be um, gains, economic gains involved. And some studies show that they can actually outweigh the costs. But I didn't include this in this analysis. And this is something I would really like to address in the future. Sorry. Oh my God. Could it be more awkward? <laughs> I still have the microphone. <laughs> hey, next up we have Thank you. Thank you.